Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new here, I am Mariana and I interview the brightest minds of physical therapy. So if you want to increase your knowledge, start right now by subscribing to this channel, clicking on the bell so you don't miss anything, give us a thumbs up and share with your friends. Today, our guest is Jeremy Lewis and he's going to talk about reframing how we care for people with non-traumatic MSK conditions. Jeremy is a consultant physiotherapist MSK sonographer, independent prescriber, professor of musculoskeletal research, and has over 150 research publications. I hope you enjoy the show. PT ProTalk podcast is only possible with the support of the forward-looking and innovative company Systems for PT, the Do Anything, Anytime EMR. Systems for PT develops systems for clinics so you can focus on your patients. Go to systemsforpt.com to schedule a demo today. Hi, Jeremy. Welcome to PT Pro Talk. How are you today? Uh, really, really good to catch up with you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm good. Awesome. I'm glad you made safely to England with these hot waves. We yeah. know it was a, a hard task to get your flights in, but I'm glad you are fine now. Thank you. So let's just... Uh, start talking a little bit about yourself for the ones that don't know you. Talk a little bit about your background and, and how did you get to where you are right now? Can I, can I exaggerate or do I have to tell the truth? No, go exaggerate. Yeah, Brag a little bit. I, I, I won't do that. <laughs> um, so um, my name is Jeremy Lewis. I was, I was born in New Zealand. Um, I grew up by the sea. Um, um, my parents moved to Australia. That's where I uh, finished high school. and. Um, was trying to work out what I wanted to do for my career. I thought medicine, dentistry, and took some time off. And um, I chose physiotherapy, and um, for reasons I'm not going to share. And um, and that's where I became a physiotherapist. And after I finished my undergraduate training, I was really lucky to get into the one year postgraduate um, masters in manipulative therapy. Or it wasn't masters then. And Jeff Maitland was teaching in those days, so I had the privilege of. Uh, learning oh. a little from Jeff, and um, then did a, another year in sports physiotherapy, and then twenty two years ago, I um, I moved to England for was planned was to move for a year because I wanted to see what it was like and travel in Europe, and one year's become twenty two years, and it's been it's been really interesting. Uh, it's been really interesting that the professions really evolved in a amazing ways since I've been here. Physiotherapists in England can refer patients for in, uh, any scans, blood tests. We can do injections. Uh, I've also trained as a sonographer, so I do a lot of ultrasound-guided injections. Um, and uh, in 2013, I think it was, they changed the law again so that um, if you did an extra about a year's training, you can prescribe any medicine that's relevant for um for patient care so i'm also an independent prescriber plus the important things doing uh, clinical physiotherapy so i work about two and a half days a week clinically i work uh, doing research and um, i also have the privilege of of teaching uh, courses around the world and i've had the pl pleasure of teaching in brazil a few times and also other south american countries and Hopefully, I think it's 2024, I'll be coming back to Brazil, Chile, Peru. Oh, um, cool. And Argentina. Nice, very nice. So I feel the physical therapy profession is very different there. We like injections, ultrasound, even like prescribing medicine. So that's very different from the US and Brazil. Uh, we can even we can spend a whole the whole episode just talking about the the, the difference that PTs in the different countries, the, the ability that they have to do different stuff. I think that's very interesting. Yeah, it is. But well, we, we have another topic to talk about today. And I know you've been studying a lot about that, researching, publishing papers about um, reframing how we care for people with non-traumatic MSK conditions. So I think that's a very interesting topic. And I just want you to just give us a brief overview of everything that you've been doing on this topic. Okay, Th thank you for the op opportunity. Um, so I, I guess it's important to sort of s explain how I got to where I got to. Um, so the first part of my career, when I chose to do physiotherapy, um, 
I, I loved the, the training and I loved the idea of being a physiotherapist. And um, like a lot of people from my generation, I think, you know, we did every possible course we could because our plan was to be the very best physiotherapist possible, the best person, you know, if someone was to come into the clinic or the hospital, then we would fix everybody. So I honestly did every course I could possibly do. Um, manipulative therapy course, the sports course, the biomechanics course, the one year biomechanics course, I didn't mention that, a whole lot of other stuff as well. And because I really wanted to be the best fixer. And then I guess 10 years or so into my career when I decided I wanted to do a PhD, I started to realize that a lot of the things I thought I was doing was not being really well supported by the research. And um, I was at a, actually a point in time where I thought, do I, do I leave this profession and I, do I do something else? Or how do I continue to be a health professional being confronted by just an overwhelming amount of research that said, I can't be the person I was intending to be? And I guess at that point, um, I, I started to sort of, I took a bit of time off, drove around Australia a little bit, did some scuba diving um, and, and sort of spent some time on beaches thinking about what do I do? And the, the, the decision was stop being a fixer, but try and be someone who coaches people, try and be a person who helps people to empower them to get the most value out of their lives, stop using uh, the language I had been using in the past, stop using the models of care I'd been using in the past and look at where the research is sitting, suggesting that we can't fix people. No one can fix people. The elective surgery that happened in Brazil today on the shoulder, which is my area of interest, is not fixing people. It's most likely very expensive placebo procedures. And, you know, your country, uh, like every country, is really struggling after the pandemic to offer sustainable health care. And, um, you know, we're all financially challenged. So why would we be uh, offering people what I consider just to be modern day bloodletting, um, if you know that term? And, and so I guess my decision was to try and be more honest with people seeking care and be more honest with myself. So um, I guess that's how I got to this idea. I don't know if that's exactly what you asked, but that's my answer. Yeah, no, that's a great overview. And I think that in the this paper that you published in 2021, uh, reframing how we care for people with persistent non-traumatic MSK pain, suggestions for the rehab community. So I... That paper, I thought it was so interesting because you start with the suggestion of moving away from that we can fix and cure you uh, to adopt a different approach to be more, um, um, more focused on education, advice, like self-management, lifestyle, all of that that you just mentioned. And I think that's a culture in our profession that we can fix you, we can cure you, we want to learn all the tools to be able to fix everybody. So I think the first thing is this culture that everybody has in their minds when we uh, go to college and learn these new techniques and all of that. So I think that's the first piece of the, the, the this puzzle that is our mentality as therapists and then the patients and then everybody else that just want the passive care be fixed and like a magical solution. Right, and so yeah, so that's that's you, you've you've summarised it really brilliantly. Thank you for doing that. Um, so it, it started, I guess, in, for me, um, uh, in seriously about 2018, when I, I was speaking to a friend, colleague, Pete, Pete, Peter O'Sullivan, who I'm sure everybody's aware of, and and we have very much the same journey. We we both from New Zealand and both in Australia um, became manipulative therapists and both wanted to cure the world. And then both had these realizations that maybe that dream wasn't really correct, wasn't supported by available research. And, um, and so I was, I was teaching in Australia for, for Pete, and uh, he's, he's in Western Australia, and um, we we're having a conversation, probably um, uh, encouraged by, I don't know, vodka or, or whiskey or something. And, um, 
and you know came up with a you know started having a conversation about you know why why are we considering that musculoskeletal problems are fixable so if someone comes into if someone comes in to uh, see a doctor and they get diagnosed with diabetes they're not going to lie on somebody's treatment couch and say I want to lie here, I want you to fix my diabetes, I want to leave this clinic without diabetes. What we're going to do is we're going to develop a really good therapeutic relationship with that individual because this is going to be a long-term relationship. And that's the beauty of physio. We can develop really good relationships with people. We can, um, the patient has to trust us, but we've also got to trust the patient. You know, like people who try to give up smoking they have days when they don't smoke and days they do smoke but we can't be judgmental with people people you know slip up whatever so we can we need to develop really good therapeutic relationships and we would educate that patient what diabetes is what the long-term consequences of having um of blood sugars outside a range of considered normal uh, why it's important to stabilize the blood sugars. We talk about the profound importance of not smoking, of sleeping, getting good quality sleep, of balancing nutrition, the profound importance of exercise. Um, and for most people with type 2 non-insulin dependent diabetes, we should be able to bring the blood sugars into a range that's considered normal. If you can't, then of course you'd prescribe metformin or, or whatever's relevant for that person. But no one, no patient and no health professional is expecting a cure in that situation. And if you think about it, the management of most non-communicable health conditions, so depression, uh, high blood pressure, it's managed exactly the same. With high blood pressure, it's the same management. You just take out the metformin and you put in a, a beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, ACE inhibitor, something to stabilize the blood pressure. For asthma, it's exactly the same management. You take out the beta block and you put in a bronchodilator. So nobody with persistent health problems is expecting a cure. We'd all like them, but they just don't exist. But for some bizarre reason, the one thing that's different with persistent health problems is the musculoskeletal conditions where based on, if we have time, we can talk about why I think it's happening. But, um, but people are coming in they are talking about their shoulder pain, their knee pain, their back pain, and they're expecting a cure. They want to leave without any pain, which they wouldn't do if they had diabetes. And to be honest, reframing healthcare for persistent musculoskeletal problems, non-traumatic, I'm talking specifically, um, uh, Marianne, about non-traumatic presentations. So for non which is 90% of the people who turn up in our clinics, um, I'm talking that if we can educate our society that uh, a non-traumatic persistent health problem should be managed, should be seen as the same as depression, diabetes, high blood pressure, asthma, where we can do so much to reduce the disability. Um, there's so many things we can do. We have to work together as a team. There's no fix. And this is going to require a lifetime's management. You can't re restore your blood sugars to normal and then all of a sudden... Um, go and buy a whole lot of um, Krispy Kreme donuts if, if people know what they are, or, you know, go to KFC or McDonald's. I've got nothing against McDonald's, but just but, but people, under, people understand what, um, what I mean. It's, it's still going to require a lifetime's management and commitment to maintaining blood sugars, and it's exactly the same for musculoskeletal problems. And if people saw it that way, if our community saw it that way, um, then the stress would be off health professionals, but also the care we could offer would be more honest. And, and sort of that's where it started. Then Peter and I, Peter O'Sullivan and I, in the WCPT, um, I think it's called World Physiotherapy now, uh, the conference just before the pandemic in, um, in Geneva, uh, we did a seminar together where we got uh, orthopedic surgeons and patients and insurance people and all sorts of people to talk about the problem. And then the president of the World Physiotherapy, Emma Stokes, who was participating, uh, she said, well, let's write this up as a paper. And that's the paper you were referring to. So the history of getting to that paper started somewhere in Perth and, and ended up somewhere in Brazil. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I think that the expectation of the patients and the therapies, that's the, the hardest thing to change because that's what people expected. Mm -hmm. We, as therapists, we are expected to fix people, cure people, and the patients the same. 
So like that's the tough question. How do we change the people's expectation about the musculoskeletal pain? Okay, so that's 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 you're asking really excellent making really excellent points. So I think if you look at the graphs of when things changed, um, a lot of it was around about the 1970s when CT was introduced and MR was, was introduced. Um, when people, so we're, we're very fortunate. We're amongst the first generations of humans who can see inside the body of people who are alive. So we had the introduction of x-rays about 130 years ago, um, and then CT, MRI, and then ultrasound in the 1980s, 1990s. And there's been an assumption, so we're very lucky that we can do that. You know, uh, as I said, we're the first generations that can. But and there's been an assumption that if you can see something that's different, then it must explain where the pain's coming from. But, but we could spend five hours talking together about the amount of research that says there's almost no correlation between what the MRI or the ultrasound scan says and symptoms. So. The, the the scenario is at the moment, so if I was to wake up, I'm just a you know, person in society, I wake up with shoulder pain, I take some ibuprofen, doesn't help. A few days later, I go and see a doctor, I get to see an orthopedic surgeon. Not that that would happen that way in England at the moment, that would take about six months, but, um, but uh, the national health system. But, um, but when I see the orthopedic surgeon, that surgeon's going to perform what we call special tests. And those special tests are designed to help us identify the structure that's causing the problem. And then the surgeon might send you off for an MRI and come back next week. We'll talk about the findings. And based on the orthopedic tests and based on the, um, the imaging, the patient might be told, um, I've got a, you've got a rotator cuff tear. And the doctor then might say, well, we can offer you physio, but in fact, we have to repair this tear. Otherwise, it will get so big, you might not be using your shoulder again. So the patient went in with pain and come out, came out with a structural diagnosis. And the, off the, tr- the way to fix the problem, because we're offering fixes in musculoskeletal care, is to offer surgery. And, you know, we could spend the whole time just talking about this issue because I'm sure in Brazil, and I've taught in Brazil, um, you know, I, I understand that, you know, it's quite diverse the access to health and and all sorts of issues but like in a lot of countries a lot of the surgeons in brazil would be offering um uh, an arthroscopic repair of the tendons is that is that a fair statement is that what would be happening in brazil america other yeah 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 i'm i'm living in the u.s right now and here i feel like it's very different from brazil the patients can get to surgery so easily so quickly it's yeah. just insane. Total knee replacement, total, total hip, hip replacement. I didn't used to treat that many people in Brazil that they've gone through the surgery. Here is like every day someone is coming in with like a hip replacement, knee replacement. Right. It's just crazy. And, and are you seeing, uh, whereabouts in the States are you based? In Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, okay. I've taught in Nashville, Tennessee. I've been, I've been to the big, the Grand Opry. I love, I love it. Oh, that. cool. Yeah, no, music. That was, that was <laughs> probably before you were born. It was uh, I don't know. I don't even remember when. But I actually I loved walking around a city where they play music in the streets. It was fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so um, so even when I've taught in the states, and 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 you know, it's quite often that very quickly a patient will have an orthopedic uh, repair of their rotator cuff tear or labral tear removal of their acromion because it's considered to cause impingement and in in many countries it's also done arthroscopically because the doctor can say well we can see the can see the structures and it's easier for me to do the repair but the patient went in with pain came out with a diagnosis of a tear was told that the tear is causing the symptoms so you'd have to agree with me that if the tear is causing the symptoms, then you want to choose a procedure that is most likely to repair the tear. And what's interesting, research I've been involved in, would strongly suggest that open procedures are more likely to repair the tear than arthroscopic procedures. But what's even more important is that there is almost no relationship between the success of repairing the tear and the clinical outcome. 
So that's the same for repairing the labrum. That's the same for biceps tenodesis. That's the same for removing the acromion. When all these surgical procedures are compared to placebo surgery, there is no difference in outcome. And so that's what, insane. it is insane. And what we are seeing is, so what did the patient go in with? Pain. They got given an explanation for their pain. There are brilliant, beautifully written systematic reviews that tell us that um, uh, if pain is the patient's main complaint, which it is in most musculoskeletal conditions, then, then that is when an invasive procedure such as surgery is most likely going to be a placebo. So what we are seeing, so, you know, if, if we were sitting having this con conversation, Mariana, talking about how great um, bloodletting is for treating, you know, if we look at the history of medicine, so 200 years ago in Europe, 300 years ago, if you had, you know, your heart was broken because the boy or girl you were in love with left you or you had asthma or you had a heart problem, the best treatment they could offer you was put your arm over a bowl and the surgeon would cut through the veins in your forearm to let the blood out. And it was considered, that was, that was called bloodletting. I'm sure you've heard of that. And that was considered to be the best medicine two, 300 years ago. And I truly believe that what we are seeing today is bloodletting, orthopedic elective practice on an industrial scale that is costing our countries fortunes, that is costing the individual time, putting them at risk. and. Um, and I, it's not going to take another 200 years to look back and say, oh, my gosh, they are so crazy then. It's it's already happening. There are studies coming out where, um, you know, that are telling us that this is placebo. And it is crazy. You know, it wouldn't take much more than a five-year-old to say, listen, you've got two treatments. One's more expensive. One's more risky. And there's another treatment, it's less expensive and less risky, and you get back to work faster. It has the same outcomes. It costs less, so we've got more money for school education, helping homeless people. Which procedure should we choose? Now, a five-year-old would be able to say, well, obviously you choose you know, the, the lower risk, lower cost treatment if it has the same outcome. Because what we're seeing, and again, I can only talk for the shoulder because that's all I know about, but, um, but if we, every study that's been published that looks at comparing surgery, which is followed by very lengthy rehabilitation, to just rehabilitation, the same outcomes that one year, 10 year follow up for impingement, whatever that means, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we are looking at a lot of waste. We're looking at overuse of medicine. And that's... I guess, the topic of our conversation, you know, how are we as health professionals going to be offering valued care that's sustainable, that doesn't bankrupt our societies? And the question then has to be, who is healthcare benefiting? Because, you know, is it the most important person in, a, in, ed, in education is the student, not the teacher? The most important person in healthcare is the patient, not the doctor, not the physio and the physical therapist. And so if what you were saying before, that you're seeing so many of these procedures uh, in, your, in your work in Nashville, but we've got alternatives, the big question is who's benefiting from this? It can't be the patient. It's somebody else. And I don't think we have to look too difficult, look too hard to find out who that person is. I've got no problem with surgery. I haven't ever, I've been accused of saying don't operate. I've never said it. What I'm saying is be honest with people seeking care. Like you would want someone to be honest with you. What are the different alternatives? What are the harms? What are the benefits? How long is it going to take? How much is it going to cost? And let people make a decision that's right for them. And, and that's not happening in musculoskeletal healthcare at the moment. And it was interesting that just two interviews ago on my podcast, I talked to an author that published in a paper about a case report of a patient with hip osteoarthritis. She went through con con conservative treatment through uh, MDT system, got better. 
she just had a little of limp on the on the hip, but she was fine. One year follow up, two years follow up, and they found out that after she ended up doing a hip replacement because her doctor told her that she was too young that it would be good to correct her problem. I don't remember if it was labral tear, something like that. Um, and even that she was feeling okay, she ended up doing the hip replacement and the limping was still there after the hip replacement. So it's just crazy that even if the person goes through conservative treatment, it is successful. Is it still this thing that they, the, the, maybe the doctor, I don't know, I don't want to point any fingers, but the patient still believes that something needs to be fixed and they are going to go and fix because of this pathoanatomical model that we live today. So that's another question. Why we keep, as you said, um, funding this low value care surgeries, subiacromial decompressions, like you mentioned on your paper, and someone is benefiting from that. And that's, that's the, the, how we, how we can change this reality. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a difficult question. I think there's lots of, that was, we addressed in the paper a little bit, how we might start to, to address it, but that's happening everywhere. I mean, it's, I've had the privilege of teaching my shoulder course in, in lots of countries in the States, South America, lots of, lots of places. And it's a problem that's happening absolutely everywhere that, um, patients have done really well with non-surgical care. They've addressed lifestyle questions. They've tried to lose weight. They've tried to uh, reduce smoking or stop smoking, understood the importance of good sleep, good nutrition, etc. done a lot of physical activity. They're feeling fine. Sometimes they're feeling better than they have in their whole lives or the, la- the memory of their life. And then they go and have surgery because they're so convinced. It's not their decision often. It's well, if you don't operate on the tendon, if we don't repair the labrum, if we don't remove the acromion, then, you know, structurally it's going to cause so many problems in the future, which is not telling people the truth. And anybody who is saying that is either not thinking about the patient's best interests or hasn't read very much research in the last 10 years, which I wonder if they should actually be in the position that they are making suggestions to to people seeking care. I think what we need to do, one of the ways that we can start addressing the problem is that we need to sit with everybody in the the process of who's, who cares for patients with musculoskeletal problems or people seeking care with musculoskeletal problems, Not don't make them patients. Um, and... Um, decide how do we explain the reasons for their pain? How do we examine them? How do we discuss the different treatment options to them, honestly, without bias? And how do we speak with one voice? So I think speaking with one voice would be a huge start because qualitative research we're publishing, the patients tell us that what they hate is that Google says one thing, the one physio says this, the osteopath says this, the orthopedic surgeon says this, the neighbor says this. They're so confused. And so I'm not, I don't blame people who get, I don't, I'm not surprised that people who get told, you know, um, well, you're feeling great now, but you've got to have surgery because they're just so confused. They're paralyzed with all this information coming at them. You know, they they want to make the best choice for themselves. And here we've got someone in a white coat who seems to know what's going on. Um, but I better follow that recommendation. And, um, and and I think the first thing is to how do we speak with one voice in a way that's not biased and not fear-mongering, not, not you know, instilling fear in people? How do we get them to get value in their lives? How do we get them to reduce their disability in the same way as we bring, bring blood sugars under control, doesn't mean the diabetes isn't there, but it doesn't mean the rotator cuff tear, tear isn't there, but they're not disabled by it anymore, which is exactly the scenario you gave with that patient with the hip problem. There's very little evidence that, you know, the, there's poor evidence of the relationship between imaging findings and symptoms in most people. And even if there is a relationship, why wouldn't you go for the healthy, let's decrease body weight a little bit, let's look at other things that we can do before we consider surgery. 
Yeah, and I think a big part of this is just teaching the patient how to take control of their pain and how to self-manage their condition. And I think that, and that requires us to move more from passive to an active approach. Um, and I think that's a big barrier for the therapies, at least, because you're very focused on like manual therapy. We need to touch the patient to feel that we are giving some value for the patient as well. So I think that, I don't know if you agree with me on that, but moving from passive to active to show patient that they should be active, they should exercise it and guide them through the process. I think that would be beneficial. So, so a paper we published during the pandemic, um, we were looking at exercise and manual therapy for shoulder pain problems. And, and I think we can strongly recommend an activity-based approach. And I also think we can strongly recommend manual therapy, but we've got to be careful about it. We can't offer just manual therapy and we can't offer endless manual therapy. We need to... So if we could only offer one treatment, it would have to be education um, and ex activity exercise. And, and certainly there is evidence for manual therapy, but in addition to exercise, in addition to education, not by itself and not for lots of it. And I, I don't have a problem, and I, I don't, I'm sure the debate's raging everywhere about, you know, should we be touching patients, should we not be touching patients? And to me, it's a pointless debate. Of course, we should be touching people. Um, you know, when, when, when you were young and fell over and hurt your elbow, your elder brothers and sisters, or, you know, or your parents or your uncle and aunt, someone that cared for you, um, you know, would, would rub your elbow. And, and so from a very early age, we learn that touch is something that another person can do that can that helps to take away pain. So I've got a two and a half year old granddaughter. And if I, you know, fall over, we're playing and so, you know, some, you know, old man now, so if my back's a bit sore when I get up, she calls it an ouchie and she'll rub it, you know, she'll rub my back or rub my knee or whatever it might be. Because, you know, she, it's in her DNA already that if something hurts, then touch, therapeutic touch has some benefit. And it doesn't surprise me that every culture in the world has developed uh, a touch-based treatment. Um, and, and, you know, the, the way I like to think about it is um, I've taught quite a few times in Iceland, which is a very beautiful country, but very difficult language to understand anything. Um, for anybody in Iceland, I don't, I'm not being rude. Um, but, um, you know, it's a magnificent place. But, I, you know, sometimes I think if I was in Iceland and I was doing a a mulligan course, and I couldn't understand what the teacher was saying to me, but I was just copying the techniques. And then the next week I was doing a, a trigger point course, and the week after I was doing a acupressure course, and the week after I was doing some other touch course. But at no stage could I actually understand what was being said to me, and I was just doing the techniques. I would actually probably be asking myself after three or four weeks, have I done the same course three or four times? Because the thing that's often different isn't the physiology, the physical touch, but it's the philosophy why you're touching. And, and I just think that we just created this problem by not saying that um, we've got these techniques, we don't really understand how they work, but when we add them to exercise, in some people, they help to reduce pain a little bit to get you going. They're not the main thing we need to do, but in some people they help a bit. And, and because you've got this acute crisis or you're having a recurrence um, and we know it's helped in the past, um, then we can use it. But it has to be built into a lifestyle management program, an activity-based program, a stress reduction program, et cetera. And we shouldn't be telling people stories about I'm deactivating trigger points, I'm reducing, a, I'm blocking a meridian, I'm decreasing stiffness in a joint, because that is not supported by the research at the moment. These are techniques that you can say we don't understand why, or we don't have to say that at all. These are techniques that when we add them to activity, uh, an active program, they can help a little bit in the short term, but that's not the priority. I think, you know, that's a more honest way of selling touch or manual therapy, whatever you want to call it. 
I'm sorry, I keep on going. I'm going on the wrong direction every time you ask a question. Sorry. No, no, no. I agree a hundred percent. And I just feel like it's important because in the beginning of my career in Brazil, we can be osteopaths. So I did the post graduation and I used to do like almost one hour just manual therapy. And then what happens is the patients become dependent on that and they want to come back and just be treated as passive. And, and then I told the patient, you have to do these exercises. You have to and show them. And they were like, no, I wanted to come here because I wanted to fix me. So I think if you depend too much on manual therapy, that's what's going to happen. And then you have that problem of uh, the, the patient being used to and depending on manual therapy to feel better and not being empowered with exercises. So I think it has to have a balance in between the use of manual that's and exercise based. And, and, and if you and, think about what we were saying in the beginning, that if that was the approach taken for someone with high blood pressure, come and lie down, I'm going to, or depression or, de, or diabetes, you know, it would be madness. But for some reason, it's become acceptable in, in musculoskeletal pain conditions. And, and probably because we learned that when you fall over and hurt your elbow and you rub it, it can, you know, whether the, your parents were thinking, uh, they're not thinking I'm unblocking the bladder meridian, but they're thinking, you know, I put in a different sensation. I'm going to show my child I love them, that, you know, maybe by the time I stop this rubbing the elbow, the pain will go away. And that's what we learn. So it's part becomes part of our DNA. But we need to address that. We need to, exactly what you said, We it's not the patient's fault, it's our fault. And, and that's where we have to reframe what a musculoskeletal management program looks like okay so here comes the question can, how can we prioritize these integrated high value cost effective approaches versus the the one that are low low value approaches okay so there's um there's a there's a term it's called a super wicked problem and um, it's a really brilliant thing to read about and learn about. There are a lot of super wicked problems in the world. Um, climate change is a super wicked problem. It's a problem that we know it exists, and but often the people who are trying to fix it are also causing the problem. So we all know what we should be doing, but we're maybe not doing in, as individuals enough. And the same with the politicians and the same with industry and the same with absolutely every part of society. And so super wicked problems are really complicated problems that people know about, but they are difficult to solve. And this issue with um, offering low value, high cost care is also a super wicked problem. Many people who want to fix it are also causing the problem. And to fix a super wicked problem, you need the cooperation of everybody. So where do we start? We start with um, the universities or the schools that are educating healthcare professionals. They have to stop teaching the same syllabus they've been teaching for 20 years or 30 years and look at what our societies need and, and get rid of the stuff that is maybe less important. So don't spend months on manual therapy. Spend a few days on manual therapy. Um, you know, these are touch techniques. This is the history of it. Uh, we can use touch in a variety of ways as an adjunct to getting people moving. Look at modalities, which modalities are effective and which modalities aren't effective based on the research. and get rid of those uh, ones that are being that, that are more dangerous or more harmful or not effective because you know if there's if there's 500,000 physios in the world and each of them is doing three ultrasound treatments a day that's 34 million i think ultrasound treatments a month how much are we contributing to climate change by you know, whatever, I, you know, I made those numbers up a bit, but, but you know, um, you, you can, someone can do the maths properly, but it's going to be millions and millions of ultrasound treatments. I'm not saying don't do ultrasound, but if there's evidence for it, use it. If there's no evidence for it, why would we have it on for 10 minutes or however long it's on for 
if it's taking electricity, we're also contributing to the super wicked problem of, of climate change. But we're also contributing to the super wicked problem of telling people we're fixing them by, by doing this treatment. Um, so it needs to be, educators need to get involved. We need to make sure clinicians have the confidence to talk to patients about um, the, that reframing a musculoskeletal problem in the way that we might be talking about other persistent problems, how we can work together, we can work closely together. And that's the beauty of physiotherapy. We've got more time, um, you know, as long as the patient trusts us. Uh, and, and we can trust them, we can spend time looking at strategies to, um, you know, to, to try and reduce the, the, the problem. And I'd love you to ask me at the end, if we've got time, you know, what do I think the physiotherapist of the future should look like? Because I think that's what we, sh we need to be prioritizing in our, in our education, undergraduate and postgraduate. We've got to get media on board, social media and normal media. We've got to get the insurance companies to change. We've got to get all providers of health to change. But also we have to educate um, members of our society not to think that this is a fixable problem, to understand that this is not that different to diabetes. And once I've provided education about diabetes, it's still me as the patient's decision what I'm going to do about it. But if I'm going to work with a health professional, it's not just receiving passive care. It's listening to the education, becoming, gaining self-efficacy, learning how to self-manage, seeking help when I have a flare-up, um, listen to all the good advice and, and try and make the changes about that. So... The, the, it is going to involve everybody. And um, if your listeners, uh, and if you can point them, I just published a paper a few weeks ago. It was called uh, uh, A Letter to a Patient. It's open access. Um, I don't know if you can provide people with a link to it. Uh, yeah, the, yeah absolutely. Support. But I, I'd, love, I'd love people to read the paper, that the first paper that Peter, and I, Peter O'Sullivan and I wrote um, reframing care, um, and also if they want to read the one that you were mentioning before, that would be great, but also the last one, the letter for a patient, because I think that's possibly a really strong way of educating ourselves but also people seeking care to think differently about their musculoskeletal problems. And, you know, maybe we can use more social media, maybe our professional bodies um, under the leadership or the guidance of world physiotherapy, you know, maybe we can produce television programs. Maybe we can produce advertising, uh, honest advertising. Um, you know that 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 what infographics or info videos that 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 people can start to understand the problems differently. It's going to take forever. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think you summarize it very well. Like the the the, the solutions, the the uh, suggestions. Um, and I think another thing that would be very important to start the change is talking about the, the elephant in the room, the paper that you wrote about the too much medicine, because I think that's in our culture. So about the, 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 the normal that's relevant to physical therapy, the posture of no abnormalities that we use to say that cause the pain, the abnormalities on the exams that actually does don't doesn't mean that you you have a problem associated with the image. So that that part of the too much medicine that you mentioned, you can talk better about it than what I'm trying to summarize here. But um, I think that having that information get to the public would also help start that change because then people would be more educated. They would have more information and have more power to make their decisions knowing that, okay, I have a rotator cuff tear, partial tear, or something that doesn't mean necessarily that I need to be fixed to feel better. Yeah, that's, ex that's exactly right. And you, you, you summarized it beautifully. That's, that, that, that's exactly it. It's, it's, it's all about education, isn't it? It's all about being able to make a decision based on information and, 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 
we, we've just finished a randomized control trial in Canada where we randomized people to three treatments. One was education, one was um, education and strengthening, and another group was education and, and a motor control program. And what we learned from that is education is so powerful. Um, but as we talked about, I think we talked about in the beginning, um, that, you know, that people, people, you know, like to learn and, and well, no, we can talk about it. This is just an old person forgetting what he's talking about. Um, that, um, that, uh, you know, that people like to learn different ways, don't they? Um, I, I can read, I can write, but it's not my preferred way of learning. Um, my preferred way is observation and being able to ask, reflect and ask questions. That's how I learn the fastest and the deepest. Um, a lot of patients in our societies are dyslexic. So providing them with a bit of paper, that's not going to help them. And the average reading age, people in, in the country I live in at the moment, in the United Kingdom, the average age people read at is nine years of age. So I don't know what it is in Brazil. I don't know what it is in America. Um, it's not going to be the age of the listeners to this podcast. We're all very privileged people, like to a large extent, if you're a doctor or a physiotherapist. Um, you know, so if we're just giving a bit of paper, and it's, first of all, the patient doesn't understand it, and we know that 50% of people do not understand information provided to them by their healthcare provider, whether that's GP, physio, or orthopedic surgeon. So if we are not providing education in three formats, how are people going to be able to make informed decisions that are right for them? How many patients go and have surgery and don't and never realised that um, you know they're going to have to have a few months off work and where's the income going to come from? And and then no, very few people actually are provided evidence that you know this might not make you better or it might actually get worse in some people. And um, you know why are sometimes people so shocked about? And why do they say to us, "I would have never done this"? If I had known, and um, you know, and of course, it's going to help a lot of people. But the reasons why it helps are maybe not because we're fixing people. Maybe it's placebo. Maybe it's because of the the time, or maybe it's because of the rehabilitation at the end. And who knows why? It's it's a very difficult question to answer. But but if we're if we're providing honest education in the format that person learns in at a level that patient understands. Providing them many opportunities to ask questions. What did, what you know? What do you want to clarify more? What didn't make sense? You know, how can we do? How can we help you understand this better? Um, in non-paternalistic ways, in non-judgmental ways, then then that's really a big foundation to improving care. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that because I had a patient. He had a rotator cuff repair, and he was thinking that he would be out of the clinic in one month like 100% good. And then when we start talking to him, explaining the protocol, he was shocked. He was like, I had no idea that I'll have to pass through all these phases, all this month. I was like, he was so frustrated. He was like, I thought like one month I'll be out of here, moving well and be gone. And, and then I think that's funny that he had no idea what the rehab would look like after the surgery. Mm. So... So it's, yeah. so it's frustrating and it's sad and it's that shouldn't happen yeah. to anybody. And also the yeah. same with physios. You know, we 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 have to physical therapists. We have to be honest with patients. You know, this is going to take twelve weeks. That you're going to have to come in for some treatment. And yes, you'll be doing a lot by yourself. But patients have to know the commitment that they need to make for for physiotherapy treatment as well. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So before I transition to the final questions, do you want to add anything else, any thoughts on this topic? Yeah, just um, um, the, the, that, that discussion about what, what I was sort of thinking as I'm coming closer to the end of my career than the beginning and sort of thinking about, you know, what, what does the physiotherapist of the future need to look like? And, um, of course, all the things that we're currently doing, but... I, I, and and this is where the change it, it sort of fits in with the conversation a bit a bit earlier, Mariana. That you know the schools need to be making sure that we're excellent communicators, we're excellent listeners. We really hear the patient and listen to the patient and don't interrupt the patient. That we are we become experts in behavioural change. We become experts in 
assessing people's nutrition. And if we learn how to help with that, great. If not, work in a multidisciplinary team to make sure that nutrition for that individual is spot on. Asking, finding out about sleep and, you know, is, is the patient's sleep health as good as it could be? And maybe educating ourselves how to assess that and how to improve that. How do we motivate people to be, you know, continue with physical activity and find different ways? But also, how do we as a profession talk to politicians and talk to the media about improving the environments? Because we know social determinants of health are more important than a lot of the physical things that we consider, such as tears, such as posture, as you mentioned earlier. So how do we improve environments so that people can exercise safely and, and easily? Um, how do we get into the junior schools, the, the, you know, the infant schools and as our profession and start educating people at a really young age about um, how do you, how do you, you know, become Serena Williams or how do you become Lewis Hamilton or somebody, you know, some famous person in terms of, you know, how do you achieve the, you know, the best you can achieve physically from your body and psychologically from your body. Um, and so, you know, I think we've got to really make some big changes. This is a wonderful time for our profession. You know, every country is suffering from this pan horrible pandemic we've all been through. We've all got to find sustainable ways to provide healthcare. Our profession is the profession that can do that. But we, in order to do it, we've got to ditch some stuff and pick up new stuff, as the research is telling us, and, of course, change in the future when the research changes. Yes, yes, absolutely. I'm going to ask a few questions. I think you answered some of them. But the first one is any resource of information that you would like to share with us that you like? Well, it just so happens that there's this amazing book that was published just a few uh, month and a half ago. Just, I don't know, not everybody who's listening to this will see it. I'll tell you, it's called The Shoulder Theory in Practice. And uh, it was edited by me and Cesar from from Spain, but um, that's the best resource. No, it's um, it, that's a resource. <laughs> uh, it focuses on the shoulder, but it touches a lot of the issues that we've been discussing. The paper, the papers that I mentioned, the one I wrote with P Peter O'Sullivan, and the one, the letter paper, and everything in between. Um, I think we learn most from our patients if we learn to listen and to really listen to people and to have a lot of empathy and to validate people's um, concerns and and not get annoyed when somebody says, oh, I've got really high pain tolerance, but this is too much for me. Because all they're saying to us is that this time I just cannot cope with it for whatever reason. It doesn't matter if they've got a high pain tolerance or not. They're just saying, I cannot cope with this. And then we've got to learn how much of this is a psychological problem, social problem, physical problem. Um, so get resources to, 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 to tick all those boxes, read papers, attend courses, and get this incredible book on the shoulder. Mm -hmm. I think you just answered my second question. That would be what, what advice would you give to a clinician that is starting uh, their careers? So, I think, so. think, about, yeah, think yeah. about what you would like or the person you care most in the world about you know, if it's your mum, your dad, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, wife, children, whatever, what care would you want them to receive? How would you like the health professional, the doctor, the physio to treat them when they come in the clinical room and become that person? Don't become... I, I had a problem with my eyes a month ago and I went to see an ophthalmologist um, and, and the guy, honestly, when I came into the room, was facing his computer back to me, said to me, not looking at me, said, you know, what, what, what are you doing here? And I said, you know, who are you? What's your name? And it was really shocked that anyone would say that. You know, just the, the way that we have to provide care is the way we'd like to receive care. And, and you know, don't ever be frightened to call out bad practice. And, um, and, a, and a, probably a more appropriate way than I did. But, but um, you know, be, be become the physiotherapist of the future. Learn about, become the best communicator, the best listener, 
become the best non-judgmental person. Um, how can we get benefit for this individual? And, and how can we do that through everything we know, through physical, sleep, nutrition, stress, et cetera, et cetera? Yes. Awesome. Well, that was great. Um, Jeremy, if people want to learn more about you, your work, or contact you, how they can find you? Through my mother. <laughs> she tells everybody how good I am. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so I think uh, probably not actually. Um, so um, yeah, so I've got a website. It's uh, drjeremylewis.com. Um, it's a work in progress. It's it could be better. I've just got no time to work on it. But uh, that's that's one place. And I I try through social media uh, uh, as much as possible to promote the papers that we've published and other people's papers. And um, and so that's. If people are interested, those are the those are the main ways. Awesome. So I'm going to put the name of these papers we discussed on the show on the show notes so people can go and check um and take a look at it. It's a, a good point to start. I really appreciate it. You did that, Marianne. Thank you. I'd appreciate it. So Jeremy, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming here and share all your knowledge with us and your insights. It was a great conversation and I just appreciate you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for taking the time to, to do the work you're doing as well, because I know your podcasts are listened to by, by many people all around the world. And um, that's how I heard about you. And, um, and so uh, thank you for the work you're doing as well. Thank you.